Well, greetings, viewers and voyeurs with Got That Funk. I've been ruminating over the fallout of the recent general election here in the UK. And UK politics isn't something I opine on very often here on my channel. But I can't help myself on this particular occasion because I find the election results for 2015 particularly disheartening. I've been in the UK now more than 25 years and I've made it a habit of staying up throughout election nights to watch the results come in because I find the British process to be very interesting and um, the uh, first past the post system can throw up some pretty unexpected results and that was certainly the case on Thursday night as it was back in 1992 um, the first general election that I was witness to in this country and in both cases uh, that first one and the most recent one, the pollsters have been completely uh, stumped by the actual election results because it doesn't bear much resemblance to the polling. But I really want to talk about the Liberal Democrats. I've admired the political party of the Liberal Democrats in the UK ever since I got here. I thought uh, throughout the 90s especially they were pretty much the only party talking sense on lots of issues. And under the leadership of Charles Kennedy, um, the Liberal Democrats wisely positioned themselves against the uh, Labour government regarding the war in Iraq and the vote leading up to it. And the party benefited from that in the 2005 election by getting more MPs than they'd ever previously had. In 2010, under the leadership of Nick Clegg, I think... Um, they made the unwise choice of going into a coalition government with the Tories. And I think that is in large measure due to the decision of Nick Clegg. I think he was basically handed a, a poison chalice because if he decided not to go into coalition with the Tories, uh, he risked isolation and further, um, what's the word, uh, diminution. He risked losing the respect that the party had started to gain. But by going into the coalition, he virtually guaranteed a loss of that respect because one of the Lib Dem promises in the 2010 manifesto was to resist the urge to raise tuition fees, which the Tory government was, or the Tory uh, manifesto had committed to. And in coalition, when the Tories decided to bump up the tu uh, tuition fees, the Liberal Democrats accepted the collective responsibility of the cabinet and voted along with the rest of the cabinet. And I think a lot of people who had voted for the Lib Dems in 2010 felt betrayed, especially the younger generation who were most directly affected by this tuition fee decision. I think by going back on their promise in their own manifesto, by refusing to break the government, when that vote came up, they betrayed an entire generation that they could have locked in as dedicated voters probably, and now they've almost certainly locked them out. I don't think necessarily that changing the leadership is going to make much of a difference with the people who were affected directly by that decision. Um, I remember there was plenty of people, my son included, who were hopping mad that the Liberal Democrats didn't stand up for what they said they were going to when push came to shove. They saw the party as having sold out. And I think at the recent election here, the Liberal Democrats have paid severely for that sellout. And it's going to take an awfully long climb to get back to where they were. This is the, the lowest number of MPs the party's had in Parliament since I've been in this country, I think. So that's a, a pretty big hill to climb. And Nick Clegg, I think, is largely to blame. Now, he did, you know, bear responsibility for the loss on Thursday and took it on the chin and resigned first thing on Friday, which I think was the appropriate thing for Nick to do. And I, I hope he reflects on the possibility that it's because of his decision to betray his own party's manifesto commitment that the Tories are now in power now. Hell, they might not have even been in power prior to now because having if they had stuck to their guns and broken the government back in the day, who knows what would have happened? It's unpredictable uh, by anybody. 
So there, that's the Liberal Democrat thing out of the way. Next, I want to talk about Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage had said during the campaign that he would resign his position as party leader if he didn't win the seat he was contesting, and he didn't win it. So he dutifully resigned on Friday. So in a sense, I respect the fact that he resigned, but it seems a bit weaselly because it was already being reported on Saturday that he might just take a vacation and put himself up for re-election should the party choose to have him. And I think that's exactly what will happen because I think a lot of the success that UKIP had at the polls, and by success I mean they had almost 4 million votes cast for their party. So. I think a lot of that, you know, is down to Farage and the fact that he was so capable of manufacturing his image with the pint in a pub and the fact that he was smart enough, considering the appeal that he was going for, he was smart enough to avoid wearing, you know, Armani or anything like that. I mean, everything that Nigel Farage was wearing, you could pretty much get off the rack probably at uh, a mid-range men's clothing outlet. So. You know, he was definitely trying to appeal to the common uh, working man, as it were, and I think it paid off. Uh, in the construction industry that I work in, I know loads and loads of men who voted UKIP this year. And um, I think everybody was thinking that because of the implied association with um, sort of, uh, you know, the anti-immigration thing, which makes UKIP come across to me personally as a, as a sort of right-wing party um, doesn't necessarily play poorly with I think a lot of the labor voters who were traditional labor voters their whole life I think might have felt that UKIP had something to offer them I think this has caught the political class off guard I think an awful lot of uh, people who used to vote for Lib Dem as their protest vote voted for UKIP as well. So I think UKIP stole a lot of votes from the Liberal Democrats this year, which I don't think anybody was expecting. I think they were expecting to uh, hemorrhage some Tory votes and, and to a lesser degree some, some Labour votes, and I'm sure that's true to some extent. But I think an awful lot of people who used to protest vote by voting Lib Dem, protest voted by voting UKIP this time around. And I think it would be unwise for any political commentator in this country to now ignore UKIP as a political force with 3.8 something million votes uh, in the general election and the UKIP candidates coming in second in many many constituencies while I was watching on Thursday night uh, a frightening number uh, they certainly leapfrogged the Liberal Democrats in almost every contest I noticed and um, it was very common that they were the second place party behind whatever party won so that being the case they're in a decent position to make some strides on the next election, which is something I don't contemplate with very much uh, enthusiasm, but you have to recognize the situation for what it is. How that's going to affect Tory policy in this administration is anybody's guess. I'm not necessarily sure that it will affect policy very much because the government is committed to offering a referendum on whether or not the UK remains part of the European Union, um, and they're committed to that in 2017. I, I strongly predict that they will obfuscate and delay that referendum, um, but then again the uh, stakes might be too high for them to get away with that. We'll see. Last but not least, I wanted to talk a little bit about Boris Johnson, who still has one year to serve as the Mayor of London, and he recently became the MP for Uxbridge and Ryslip. Now, I don't really care whether Boris is capable of doing two political posts at the same time simultaneously. I think, you know, he's obviously a gifted politician as far as politicians go. But inevitably, even before he actually won the seat in Uxbridge, people were talking about whether or not Boris Johnson was going to be the next prime minister if and when David Cameron steps down. And Cameron, I think, is already on record having said that he's not going to serve a full five-year term if they won this election. That said, no one was expecting the Tories to actually win an outright majority, so it's possible that Cameron might decide he wants to stay on if he, uh, you know, when time develops. Nevertheless, the way the media uh, seems to portray it, it's almost as if it's a fait accompli that Boris Johnson not only will be the next conservative leader, but the next prime minister. 
it's like almost it's, the way they talk about it, it's like we won't even have a choice. I mean, if Boris is is the the candidate for um, you know the the leader of the Tory party, he's just so charming, and we'll all be overcome by his charisma and uh, and whatever. Uh, I I'm not a fan of Boris Johnson, and I'm sure it shows. Uh, I, like I say, I'm sure he has his talents as a politician, but frankly, I, I think he's a bit scary as regards his views. Um, but for a Tory, uh, he has some liberal leanings, I suppose, and I, 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 ought, I ought not to overlook that. I just have such a deep personal distaste for the guy. I've been aware of him for virtually 20 years now, and uh, I've just never, ever liked him. So the idea that he might one day be prime minister kind of makes me sick to my stomach. Anyway, I just wanted to throw in my two cents worth for whatever that is worth. It's probably worth less than the two cents, but there you go. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I look forward to your comments down below. And until next time, may all your ups and downs be ups.